Thank you, Susan. Uh, it's it's a pleasure finally being with you in the in this uh, wonderful Nova network. Uh, uh, well, so my my um, my seven minutes I want to spend uh, talking uh, about the uh, ultra processed food and addiction. Uh, in the title of my uh, presentation, it said that uh, ultra processed food I engineer it to be addictive. Actually. I have two initial observations uh, regarding this. First of all, although this is true, this does not mean that every ultra-processed food is addictive for every person. But the same occur with other substances uh, with addictive potential, like uh, tobacco, alcohol, and cocaine, and other things. A, a second uh, important observation is the fact that, and here perhaps there's a difference with tobacco, is the fact that uh, ultra-processed food actually, uh, uh, the main purpose of uh, making ultra-processed food is, is not to uh, produce addiction. Uh, the main purpose of ultra-processed food making is to replace, to create products that can replace non-ultra-processed foods or real foods and generate profit and maximize, amplify profits of the food industry. Uh, 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 to understand this better, we need to understand uh, how ultra-processed food is defined. Ultra-processed food is defined within the NOVA food system classification, the same NOVA name. Uh, NOVA divides uh, all the foods that we consume into four groups. Uh, the first group is made of unprocessed or minimally processed food, which are foods uh, as they exist in the nature uh, or slightly modified. Cereals, cereal grains, legumes, meat, milk, eggs, fruits, vegetables, nuts, all of these, they belong to Nova Group 1. Uh, Nova Group 2 is made of uh, processed culinary ingredients, fat, sugar, salt, everything we use to prepare, cook, to season Nova Group 1 foods. And this is a very important food group. And it's a very important contribution of the food industry because this makes easier to prepare, to consume foods. The third group is made of uh, processed foods. And these include all these old processed foods we know uh, they are done by the industry in, in a very similar way. We can prepare them at our kitchen. So the industry does process food, but we could do them in our kitchens by adding salt, sugar, fat, oils to Nova Group 1 foods. The ultra-processed food, which is the Nova 4 group, is entirely different because they are, they are actually not foods. They are formulations of uh, many ingredients uh, these ingredients are mostly of exclusive industrial use. And these ingredients uh, are, of course, they come from foods, but they are parts, components of food. They are protein isolates, they are starches or sugars or fats that are extracted from foods, but are often mod chemically modified. And these formulations also include many additives, particularly cosmetic additives that gives flavor, color, texture to this uh, formulation. And, but it's not just the, 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 the process which is different when we consider group one, two, and three, and group four. It's the purpose of food processing. And uh, while in Nova group one, two, and three, the purpose is essentially to prolong food duration, which is very important, to facilitate food preparation, or to modify or enhance food sensory properties, as in the case of bread and cheese that with fermentation. The purpose of ultra-process, the food ultra-process is entirely different. The, the, the purpose is to create novel products to replace Nova Group 1, 2, and 3, and all the culinary preparations we can make with these three food groups, and to maximize profit. Uh, to allow profits that are much higher than the profits that food industry will have 
by doing over group one, two, or three. And, and how the industry can achieve this purpose? Uh, first of all, using cheap ingredients. So then most ultra-processed foods are made from proteins, car carbohydrates, uh, oils, and fat that are obtained for high yield crops, soy, corn, sugar. So first thing is to use cheap ingredients. So you, you, don't see, you won't see uh, expensive ingredients like whole foods in ultra-processed foods. But by having only these cheap ingredients, you, you don't really create attractive product. People will not replace Nova Group 1, 2, and 3 if they are not attractive. And actually, they are made not only attractive, but they are made artificially hyperpalatable thanks to the use of additives. So the flavor, the color, the texture people appreciate so much in ultra-processed foods are not natural. Uh, they don't come from the, the, the ingredients use it, but they come from additives. So essentially food ultra-processing creates products that are very attractive. They are affordable because they, are, they have cheap ingredients, so they are affordable. Usually they can cost less than the non-ultra-processed alternative. And at the same time, they maximize profit. So, some people say this is a win-win situation because consumers have affordable and very pleasant products and the food industry has more profits. Of course, it's not a win-win situation. And it's not a win-win situation because our organism, human organism, although they can adapt it to different foods and many foods and many diets all over the world, there's a limit. On the, on the what type of foods or what type of products our organism can consume and utilize. So the, the ingredients, the process used in the manufacture of ultra-processed food, they created products that are not utilized in a proper way. And uh, resulting from these are all the diseases that Susan mentioned, obesity, diabetes at the beginning, that these were the most obvious consequences of food, ultra processed food intake. But now we have abundant evidence that this, the consumption of these foods, they produce cardiovascular diseases, certain types of cancer, kidney, liver diseases, uh, even depression, cognitive, cognitive failure, uh, I mean, many chronic diseases that we know are very important to explain the burden of disease, the present burden of disease of the humankind. So then it's not a win-win situation. Uh, the, the, the research around the mechanism that the link, why ultra-processed food cause uh, so big a spectrum of diseases is because we have several mechanisms. So, the most obvious is the fact that people lose the capacity to regulate energy balance. And there's a very strong evidence on this that people that consume a, an ultra processed diet with most food being ultra processed foods, they consume up to 500 kilocalories more every day of their diet. So this, this is very clearly demonstrated. But you have other mechanisms. Uh, as, as I said, in the, in the formulation of ultra-processed foods, uh, uh, the industry uses several additives. Uh, many ultra-processed foods, most ultra-processed have five or more additives. So these additives are xenobiotic. They, they, are not, they don't belong to food. They are strange to our, our body. So then it's, it's reasonable to expect that uh, we'll have problems uh, after consuming ultra-processed food. But there are other mechanisms, the, the plastic, the, 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 the biochemical compounds that are released by plastic materials. We have things that are produced due to high temperature, high pressure. We have marketing, which is very important because since these products are highly profitable, the industry has all the interest to invest resources in the marketing of these foods. So there's a lot of discussion right now not only, not just about the, what are the, the diseases associated with ultra-processed food, but what are the mechanisms? And then I, I will finish my intervention here. 
with this point. Uh, it, 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 for, it, it's understandable that the research researchers want to understand better why ultra processed foods are so bad for our health. But this will take time. I mean, to to identify, and maybe we will not, we never, we will know all the mechanisms that link these so novel products uh, to to disease. The the problem, the question I, I want to leave with you right now, and I hope my colleagues can talk more about this. It's do we need to understand exactly all the mechanisms that link ultra processed food? or different types of ultra processed foods to different types of disease. Do we need to understand this before starting to have policies to stop the increase of ultra processed food that we see all over the world? So my, my position here is no, that the evidence we have right now, it's enough to recommend people and to recommend politicians to have policies to stimulate the consumption of minimally processed foods, non ultra processed foods, and to and, and make people to avoid these products. So policies here could be taxation, could be warning labels. Uh, we need, of course, information to the, the, the public. But my point is here, the evidence now is enough to start to do something regarding this. I'll stop here. Thank you, Silvia.